especially today. I've had too much coffee. I had to travel both last Saturday, this yesterday as well, and uh, yeah. So we'll see how this goes. <laughs> Uh, so the title today is, is simply joy. I mean, that's the, the theme for, for Advent for today. And I think we started out with the definition up there. And I, I pulled it from this academic fact book that I've got on, you know, some of my fancy software. But it reads just this way. Close relate, related to gladness and happiness, although joy is more a state of being than an emotion, a result of choice. One of the fruits of the Spirit, having joy is part of the experience of being a Christian. And part of the reason I chose to do that is it also has the, sort of the Hebrew rendering and the, the Greek rendering up there. Because joy is not the way we normally think of it. Um, it's closely related to some other words that you find in Scripture. Rejoicing, which is really kind of just expressing joy, or gladness, or thanksgiving, and they're all related. So if you ever want to get a, a good grasp of what Scripture means by joy, you kind of have to look at all those other things too. And uh, yeah, I was thinking about it too. Joy is something that's kind of in short supply. Like I said, I've been traveling a lot, had to do army stuff uh, the last two weekends, and so I, I turn on podcasts when I'm driving. And, you know, podcasts are always about current events. They're always about, and there seems to be a lack of joy in our world, but it, it's like hope and it's like peace. It's like all the other themes. It's something that's promised to us, and it's part of how we're supposed to be different in the world. So going back to the Christmas story, going back to Luke chapter 2, which we heard read earlier, um, just verses 10 and 11, but the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah and the Lord. So today we're going to bounce around in Scripture a little bit and, and really find out a little bit about what joy means. And the first thing was, I, I wanted to look at how joy was expressed in the Old Testament. Um, and I'll put it this way, there's four different things that I really found was, they express joy over who God is. Just simply over who God is. They, they did it repeatedly. They express joy over God's deliverance. And we know that story. That he delivered them from Egypt. Um, he delivered them from other nations, other oppressors. They showed joy in God's presence because God was present in the midst of their camp, whether it was in the tabernacle or if it was in the temple in Jerusalem. And they expressed joy in renewal. So we'll get to all of those. But the first example I have is from Psalm 95. It's verses 1 through 5. And I don't think we have it on the screen, but it's a good one to just listen to. It's, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God a great king above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it. And his hand formed the dry land. So this right here is just an example of them expressing joy and celebrating who God is. They're talking about this God who is above all. They say he's a king above all gods. And they're celebrating God who's an awesome creator. Talking about the depths of the earth and the mountains being raised up. And they expressed joy in that. A lot of times we, you know, aren't necessarily joyful when we think about those things. I want this to challenge us today because joy is in such short supply. But the other thing is, they express joy in this God of deliverance. So, if you'll remember Hezekiah, um, he was considered a righteous king over, over the tribe of Judah, over Judah. And he saw a lot of things happen. He saw the destruction of the northern kingdom. You know, they had the divided kingdom for a period. And the Assyrians swept in and took over. And he saw all of that. But he also instituted some reform. He was there for a siege of Jerusalem. They came in and they uh, laid siege to Jerusalem and they withstood that. And, and it says this in Second Chronicles 30, uh, verse 21. It says, The Israelites who were present in Jerusalem celebrated the Feast of the Unleavened Bread for seven days with great rejoicing, while the Levites and the priests praised the Lord every day with resounding instruments dedicated to the Lord. So when we talk about joy, celebration is another thing that is, is part of it. And like we said, rejoicing, that is joy expressed. And this all happened in the city of Jerusalem. It's the city of David where God came to dwell in the midst of his people. It's the place where he would come and dwell in the temple and, and speak to the high priests. So they were celebrating his presence. Not only his deliverance from the Assyrians and from that, that siege, but his presence. And it was during the festival of unleavened bread. It was the time where they were celebrating their deliverance from the Egyptians. 
and celebrating his, uh, God's provision during their time in the wilderness. So it goes on to say this, Hezekiah spoke encouragingly to all the Levites who showed good understanding of the service of the Lord. And for seven days they ate their assigned portion and offered fellowship offerings and praised the Lord, the God of their ancestors. So they were showing joy too in their understanding of God and they were showing joy in their service. It was the fact that they were, they understood God for who he was and they understood that they had a part in serving him. And so there were several things that they did that expressed that. They took joy in their assigned portions. It, it was recognizing a blessing. In our Bible study, we're in Exodus, and we, we talked a little bit about the institution of the, um, the festivals and, and some of the laws and those sorts of things. And there was the, the dedication of the, uh, of the tabernacle. And that sacrifice, a lot of it was burnt up. And there are certain sacrifices where everything was burnt up. But for most of them, it was sitting down and celebrating a covenant meal with their God. They'd bring a sacrifice for their sin, or they'd bring a sacrifice as a fellowship offering, but they would sit down with the priest and then eat that sacrifice. It was more like a big barbecue, you know? Um, so they took joy in their assigned portion, the thing that God gave them. They took joy in their fellowship offerings. It says they offered up their fellowship offerings and they would celebrate their fellowship not only with God, but with one another. That's an amazing thing that we often don't think about is that we can have fellowship with God. The, the one who created everything offers us fellowship. That's part of what we celebrate with communion and with the Lord's table. It says they praised the Lord. And, and to me what I see in here is that they expressed their joy. They rejoiced together as part of a community. So that's another thing we learn about joy from the Old Testament. They, they took joy in all these things, the, who God is, God's deliverance, God's presence, God's renewal, and they understood that it was something that was to, to be participated in together. And it was finally, it was to the God of their ancestors. They recognized this consistency, this consistent legacy of God and his people, and that they were a part of it. And so when we express joy together, that's something we should do too. That's why we dive into the Old Testament. And that's why we look back at the New Testament church. And we recognize that God was doing the same thing in those people that he's doing for us. And they express their joy in that. So another thing, not just deliverance and presence, but God's renewal. Um, stepping a little further forward during the uh, Assyrian, um, we call it the diaspora, right? Israel had been conquered. And what they had done is they had taken the Israelites and they would spread them all throughout the kingdom. And they did that so that they couldn't come together and they couldn't rebel. And that was a typical thing during the time. But then Cyrus became the emperor, the king of the, of the Persians, of the Assyrian Empire. And he decreed that he was going to allow them to go back and renew their temple and renew worship services at their temple. Um, and it says this, it says, on the 14th day of the last month, the exiles celebrated the Passover. The priests and the Levites purified themselves and were all ceremonially clean. And the Levites slaughtered the Passover lamb for all the exiles, for their relatives, the priests, and for themselves. So the first part is that they started to do sacrifice. They started their celebration, and it was for the exiles. It was for the people who returned. It was for people who had been dragged away from their homes and possibly even the next generation and now they were returning. So they were getting ready to celebrate a renewal for Israel. It goes on and says, So the Israelites who had returned from exile ate it together with all who had separated themselves from the unclean practices of their Gentile neighbors in order to seek the Lord, the God of Israel. And for seven days they celebrated with great joy the festival of unleavened bread because the Lord had filled them with joy by changing the attitude of the king of Assyria. So he assisted them in the work of the house of God and the God of Israel. So again, we have this deliverance too. Always celebrating that. They're celebrating the Passover once again, but under different circumstances. They're um, sacrificing the Passover lamb because of a return from exile. And they're celebrating a change of heart. This is renewal. They're celebrating a change of heart for the Israelites. They wouldn't have been conquered. They wouldn't have been under the Assyrian rule if they hadn't drifted away from God. But now they're back. And they're intent on doing the right thing. And so it's a God who renews his people but also a God who changed his hearts and transformed. He transformed the heart of Cyrus, the king of the Assyrians. 
and they were celebrating for those who then separated themselves. During this diaspora, there were a lot of people that had been taken away from the land, but there were people who remained, and they'd fallen into the same practices as the Gentiles and as the Canaanites that still lived in the land. And they were celebrating the ones who set aside those practices and came back to be part of the renewal of the temple. So there's joy and renewal as well. So I want to step into the New Testament with the rest of it. There's joy in redemption. And these come from Jesus' words. He says, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and he goes home. So this is a reminder, really, of some of the things that happened in Ezra's day, this time with the decree of Cyrus. The people who stray and wander he says he takes great joy in those who come back. This is a metaphor for how God feels about his people and how God feels about anyone he, who he can bring back into his kingdom, who he can redeem. It also reminds us of the prodigal son, the one who was raised up and then wandered off, squandered his inheritance, squandered his father's wealth, and when he came back, the father greeted him with joy and laid out a feast for him. So there's joy in redemption. And it, here it is, Jesus saying, that that's the kind of joy I, God, take. And here we see the, the joy expressed. It goes on. This is Luke 15. Uh, then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not repent. We can take joy in a God who pursues the lost. And he did that for each and every one of us. I mean, if you still don't know him, he's doing that for you now. We can take joy in a God who does that. He cares about his creation so much that he will continue to chase his people until he closes out time, until Jesus comes again. And he made that point over and over again to Israel. And we as we're the Gentiles, right, in this story, <laughs> we have that same promise. So join redemption. And, and here we have this, this man saying, rejoice with me. The shepherd saying, rejoice with me. Again, it's part of this community. I think that's something that uh, sometimes, sometimes we lose. I, I've, I've told this before, one of my pet peeves. Um, some of the ways that we can rejoice together is when we celebrate things like baptism when somebody shares a testimony, a lot of times I tell things from my life. If I'm going to dime somebody out on something stupid, I'll do it to myself. But also, there have been great things that God's done in my life. One of my pet peeves is when people want to do a baptism in private. I'm like, no, that's a celebration. You've entered into the kingdom. That's something to be shared as a community. And Jesus says that there will be more rejoicing in heaven more rejoicing in heaven than there is here on earth. That's kind of convicting to me that the angels, that God himself would rejoice even more than we do over our own salvation. But think about it this way. Joy is a reflection about, of how God feels about his relationship with us. The greatest joy you felt is it pales in comparison to the joy God feels about his relationship with us. So stepping in, there's also celebration. There's joy in God's presence. I'm going to step into John, John the Baptizer's words, not, not John the Gospel writer. Um, John the Baptizer. He said this in, in John chapter 3. He says, The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and it is now complete. He must become greater and I must become less. So John here is talking about Jesus. Jesus is the bridegroom, and he's saying that his joy is made complete. It, it's this metaphor that he uses. He's saying that you feel joy when the bridegroom is pre present. We should feel joy when Jesus is present. And oftentimes we forget he's present with us whenever we choose to pay attention. He feels joy when he hears his voice. We should feel joy when we hear Jesus speaking when we hear God speaking in our hearts and minds. That's something that uh, I've struggled to learn is sometimes God speaks and he's like, okay, you screwed up. But he loves the ones that he corrects. We should take joy in that, even when he's correcting us. And a wedding is a time of celebration. 
Uh, when God is present and speaking, that's a time when we should feel joy. And then John concludes and says, he must become greater and I must become less. And I think that that says several things. For John, he, he was talking about his status as a prophet. He was really the last true prophet before Jesus came. And he said, I, he must become greater and I must become less. But I think this also speaks to our transformation as, as Christians. Um, there's a time where we have to become less, where we have to set aside who we think we are, who we are in the flesh, who we are when we're separate from God, and we have to let God and His Spirit really transform us and change us. It, it's kind of the idea in this particular case, you have to kind of get out of the way. You've got to remove the hindrances. And some of those hindrances are external, and some of them are internal. He must become greater and I must become less. Then there's joy in abiding. Is, is, my, is my mic going? It's kind of in and out? No? Okay. Uh, there's joy in abiding. And these, again, are from Jesus' words. And the, the idea of abiding is a place where you dwell or where you rest. Um, it comes from John chapter 15. It says, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain, or abide, in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in His love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. So each of these three times where you see remain, that's the same word as abiding. And it has this implication of resting. There's this idea that Jesus rests in the Father. Jesus abides in the Father. And then it talks about us resting in or abiding in Jesus. And when you recognize what that means, that means we also rest and abide in the Father and also the Holy Spirit. And so all of these are wrapped around the idea of love. They're wrapped around the idea that the Father loves the Son, the Son loves us, and that we should love them. And then when we keep His commands, when we step forward in obedience, that brings joy in our life. We recognize that love, we abide, we rest in Him, and that leads us to doing the things that He wants and it brings joy in our lives. When you think about it, when we talk normally about where you abide, it's the place where you live, right? It's home. It's that cozy place too. And there's joy in that. So there's this constant remembering of God's love and it's made complete in obedience. And we should take joy in that. Another one is joy in all circumstances. We find this all throughout the New Testament. Uh, it's constant. We're told to have joy even in adversity. We're told to have joy in suffering. We're told to have joy in persecution. And, and we don't do that. We oftentimes gravitate towards happiness, right? Happiness is transient. Happiness is when the checking account, you know, you got a good balance. Happiness is when the, all the cars are running right, the tires are up. Happiness is when, um, you know, the person that you love is, is telling you that, that, that they love you. Happiness is all these other things that are transient in life. And yet there's all these times where we're told to have joy in adversity. We have joy in trouble, have joy in suffering, have joy in persecution. And these aren't up there, but just a short list. Matthew 5, 11 through 12 tells us to have joy in adversity. Acts 5, 4, 1 Thessalonians 1, 6, 2 Corinthians 7, 4, Colossians 1, 22 and 24, Philippians 2, 17 through 18. I don't expect you to remember that. There won't be a quiz. <laughs> But you get the idea. You can just list it time after time. We're to come before God in difficulty with thanksgiving and with joy in our hearts. Philippians 4, 4 through 7 says, Rejoice. So again, that's expressed joy. Rejoice in the Lord always. I say again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So it says, do not be anxious about anything. Don't be anxious in any situation. No, I'm angsty when I get up in the morning. <laughs> but it says, but with prayer and petition and thanksgiving, come before God. That's a great lesson to remember. Anytime you're feeling anxious, it's really about speaking to and being in a constant conversation with God. When your anxiety starts to get to you, pray. When your anxiety starts to get to you, give thanks to Him for the good things in your life. Hunt the good stuff. That's the Master Res Resiliency Training <laughs> quote right there. 
bring your petitions for him because there will be difficulty in this world. And we have a good example of that. Paul, who's oftentimes the one telling us to have joy, also prayed when things were bad. He brought his petitions before God. But the context of this passage is really about living in good order with one another. So don't be anxious. Come before God. Speak to Him always. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16-18 says, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So that's a repetition in another letter to another church. But rejoicing and expressing joy is God's will for you. That's what this one adds. This is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And finally, there's joy in the Spirit. Galatians 5, 23. We all know this one. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. That's transformation. This passage right here is transformation. This passage is not our natural state. Matter of fact, the verses right before it speak about what the fruit of the flesh looks like. And it's all kinds of nasty things. And then it turns to this and says, this is the fruit of the Spirit. So we have to understand that joy is a God-given thing. It's not really our natural inclination as humans being. Maybe happiness in the moment is our natural inclination, but joy comes from God. And it comes from God living in you. When you accept Jesus as Lord and Savior and He pours His Spirit into you, if you can get out of the way, there will be joy in your life. That's convicting. I don't always get out of the way very well. But joy comes from God living in you. So let's wrap it all up, bring it back around to the Christmas story. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good, noise, good news, not good noise, good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. That should bring us great joy in this season. Family, busyness, presence, the fire hazard that is the Christmas tree, all of those things might bring us some anxiety. But it's about that babe born and lying in a manger. And that should be our joy in this season. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you indeed for who you are. We thank you that you are the mighty and majestic God who delivered his people, not only from Egypt, but each of us from our own sins, from the tyranny of the flesh. Lord, we thank you for that deliverance. And Lord, we thank you for the renewal you offer. We, we thank you for the fact that even though we've cast aside what you designed us to be just by our, our very human nature, our, our bent towards sin, you bring renewal when you... Uh, when we accept you as Lord and Savior, when we accept your Holy Spirit into our lives. And even though that renewal won't be complete until the time when you come again, Lord, we are able to grasp at it in the here and now. We are able to strive for the things that you desire. Lord, we thank you for your redemption. We thank you for your presence. Lord God, may all of these things give us joy. May we abide in your joy. May we carry your joy in all circumstances, as is your will. Raising up our petitions, our thanksgiving, before you in every moment. Lord, we thank you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.